Of course, a verse we'll, we could probably all quote, John 3.16, by heart. But maybe there were one or two thoughts tonight, maybe, that you've not had before. I'm not planning to preach for a long time, but hopefully there'll be something worth uh, worthwhile. So John 3.16 then, just the one verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, of course, the Lord Jesus here is talking to Nicodemus, um, and these are his own words to Nicodemus. And I'm just going to look at it more or less word by word and see what uh, the Lord has for us. And the first important word, I guess, is God. For God so loved the world. The gospel, of course, begins with God himself. Uh, and Peter reminds us in his first epistle of the plan of God to save and that it was made before the world was created. First Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ that of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So God planned the gospel before even the world was made. So the gospel begins with God. It's God's great message. It's all based upon God's wonderful love, as the verse goes on to, to make clear to us. For God so loved the world. Not simply so much as we might, as we might think of it, but... Uh, in this way, God so loved the world, God loved the world in this way, if you will, that he gave his only begotten son. So it's like saying uh, so much, but giving us a picture of the greatness of that love. So God, for God so loved the world. Have a look at what, uh, 1 John chapter 4, if you want to. 1 John chapter 4. God so loved the world just focusing on that loved chapter 4 and verse 8 he that loveth knoweth he that loveth not knoweth not God for God is love love defines God I think it's fair to say and God defines love God so loved the world what a precious and important truth that is uh, any so-called love among men and women which, was not, which does not include God is not true love as defined in the word of God. There is what one man calls performance love which is so common, the kind of thing you find perhaps in the majority of marriage, performance love. I will love you provided you do the things I expect you to do. I will love you provided you carry on being as good looking as you were when we were married. I will love you provided you do this. You do. It's performance love. Um, and in a sense it's a love of self. I will love you as long as you please me. And so much of the so-called love in the world I fear is no more than that. But God's love is out of who he is. He cannot wink at sin because apart from the offence to his person men hurt and enslave themselves by it. This is why preachers ought to preach against sin, because it is damaging to every everyone that's involved in it. Leave alone the dreadful consequences of dying without Christ. And I think, yes, God cannot wink at it because, because of the offence to his person, and perhaps that's the primary thing, but also because he knows what harm men and women do to one another um, when they don't... Uh, love him a loving God can take no pleasure in men destroying one another such as we're seeing now and, and the, of course it's always been the history of the world uh, this is the way men are regrettably the God of the Bible is all almighty and this would put all mankind in danger if it was also not perfect love imagine an omnipotent God who lacked love. What a danger we'd all be in. And his perfect love is quite consistent, praise God, with his mighty power. 
And I'm so thankful for that. But he's also compassionate. For God so loved, we read next, the world. God so loved the world. Now there are at least three different Greek words translated in our King James as world. Um, and this one here, I believe, means the world of men. I won't explain what the others are or what they mean because it's not relevant. But this word here, translated world, means the world of men, mankind. God so loved the world. And here, of course, I disagree with the Calvinist. He says that God only loves those whom he chose before the world uh, was made without the will of man having any part. So it was totally a question of God choosing, foreordaining before the world, who of all mankind should be saved and who should be damned, and man's will's got nothing to do with it. That's Calvinism. I don't agree with that. I don't think that's Bible. He chose some to be saved, in other words, and he chose others, naturally, to be lost. Uh, the Calvinists might try and squirm out of that, but it seems to me that's, that's, the, you know, that's the only conclusion we can draw. And those men have no choice in the matter. And I think that's abominable, personally. I think that's an abominable teaching. A Christian author called Dave Hunt has written a book called What Love Is This? in which he challenges the so-called notion of love among Calvinists. God loves, I believe, all the men in the world but only saves those who believe upon him. He loves all the men in the world, but he only saves those who turn to him in faith. Those who resolutely refuse his love, he has no choice but to destroy, because they would attempt to destroy heaven itself if he took them there. Lots of churches will have a sign outside, I've perhaps said this many times, saying, all are welcome. Well, God hasn't got a sign outside heaven saying, all are welcome. Sinners, are determined, resolute, unrepentant sinners are not welcome. And they're not welcome here either. A man who wants to hear about the Lord in sincerity, he's welcome. What a woman. A man or a woman who is really inquiring, wants to know more about God, they're welcome. But I wouldn't welcome a troublemaker. We've had heretics here in the past. I wouldn't welcome them back unless there were some signs of real repentance. So I believe when the scripture talks here about God so loved the world, it means the world of men and it means all men in the world. Look at Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. where the thing is phrased differently, but uh, I think makes it clear, very clear. Hebrews 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For every man. Not just the elect, but every man. And once that every man believes and turns to Christ, he becomes among the elect. God just happened to know who that was before he made the worlds. But he never insisted that man believe or didn't believe. First John chapter 2. First letters of John chapter 2. And verse 2. Speaking of the Lord Jesus, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now the Calvinists again will tell you that means Chinese people, Japanese people, Russian people, not, not, all, not everybody, but just from among those people. But how would a plain man understand this? What would, what would a plain man picking up the Bible for the first time understand here for the sins of the whole world? Sure you would understand that to mean everybody. I believe that's the plain sense of the text. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And verse... 
3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For it is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Again, plain English means he died for everyone. God so loved the world, he loved everyone. I'm not going to multiply texts, I think we've had three, we could, we could, we could find more, but I'm not going to do that. Our text then in John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave that he gave God so loved that he gave love, real love is generous God's love moved him to give the love of Christ moved him to give have a look at 2nd Samuel chapter 9 I think gives a little picture of it 2nd Samuel chapter 9 And the first verse. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? That's a good Christian sentiment. He wants to show kindness to Saul's family who had persecuted him. And God longs and loves to show kindness and love. God so loved the world that he gave. It looks around saying, who can I bless? And gave, of course, means gave up to the cross. Not just that he gave him for men to look at, he brought him into the world, but he gave him up to the cross, I believe is the meaning of that word. Uh, and what a, what a majestic and an indefinable height of love that God should give his own son to the death of the cross. It couldn't possibly be greater love. There couldn't possibly be greater love than that. And the son came and gave himself firstly for his love to his father. This is clear from his ministry and particularly from his prayer in John 17. That the Lord Jesus came to please his father. He came because he loved his father. He came to save us because the father wanted us in heaven. So we have God on the one hand loving the world wanting to redeem men from the world and we have Christ the Son coming and giving himself up to the death of the cross to save us. Truly the God of the Bible, our God, the Christian God is a, is a wonderful God. And that the Father and the Son should do this and break the bliss that they enjoyed in eternity for sinners such as you and I. It's wonderful. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Marvellous enough that God and the Son, the Father and the Son, should be separated. Marvellous enough that God should give his own Son up to the cross and lay all our sins upon him, but that he would do it while we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners. He would do that for us. My prayer of late has been that I might know more of the love of God. This is my greatest need, and it's yours, that we might know more of the depth of of the love of Jesus as Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 3 I think it is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him I should have had something to say about his only begotten son but I, for some reason I've completely missed that out of my notes but we know who I'm talking about that whosoever believeth in him we read and again whosoever confirms my understanding of the world he gave his son that whosoever not just the elect but whosoever believeth in him shall have everlasting life believeth in him we are saved of course by faith we understand this but this faith this biblical faith 
includes repentance and I have been called a heretic and a reprobate for saying this by a man who professed to be a Christian I won't tell you the things he said to me but a reprobate and a heretic we'll leave it at that just for saying that there needed to be repentance but it's clearly taught if you read on and we're in a moment in John 3 we see this, look at verses 19 and 20 of John 3 just reading on a couple of lines really John 3, 19 and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved so he says that those that believe would be saved but then he says this is the reason they don't believe verses 19 and 20 because they love the darkness men will not come to Jesus because they love the darkness clearly and contextually they prefer the darkness a simple illustration I made up some months back but, but perhaps you'll get the picture you cannot go to London from here without leaving Dudley try it you've got to leave Dudley to go to London or you've got to leave London to come to Dudley you can't just believe and not turn away from the darkness you're looking puzzled Chris you're looking puzzled long day okay you, you, you know, if going to London is going to Jesus, you've got to leave Dudley. <laughs> As du Dudley's dark, but you've got to leave Dudley, you see the point. You can't believe and not repent. Save, saving faith is impossible without repentance. We are driven, we are drawn rather to him by his sacrifice for us we see how beautiful he is and how ugly our sin is and we want him instead so we call upon him I myself was, was I don't know that I had and I, I suppose it's the same in many converts we're not always as convicted of our sin as we ought to be but in my life what happened was I was just a broken mess basically I'd made a mess of my life I knew I'd, I knew I'd made a mess of my life a man came to see me, told me about the Lord Jesus and I knew I needed him there wasn't deep conviction perhaps as there might have been but I knew I needed him and I turned to him and as time has gone on he's shown me how much I need him far more than I realised back then so although we repent it is still not of works some people understand repentance as being works this brother, well he's not a brother actually I don't believe he's a brother, this man who called me everything under the sun thinks repentance is works but repentance can be no more than a willingness to turn because we have no power to turn we have no power really practically to turn until the Lord indwells us following our calling upon him we simply call upon him in our need we simply call him on him realize what sinners we are and what a wonderful saviour is we call upon him we're willing to turn from the darkness but we don't have the power to turn from the darkness we must call upon him and he rescues us from the darkness uh, have a look with me at John uh, sorry Luke chapter 5 those who only know John 3.16 ought to read Luke chapter 5 and verse 32 Luke chapter 5 verse 32 I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance funny they don't read that one this brother phoned me up once he said read John 3.16 read John 3.16 believeth 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 well, I might have said to him read, read Luke, read Luke 5.32 I've come not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance repentance and, and belief are two sides of the same coin you can't have one without the other you can't have saving faith and love your darkness which is what is being taught in many a place now and I think personally for the clear biblical definition of repentance have a look at the Lamentations 5 Lamentations chapter 5 
and verse 21 and this to me says it all turn thou us unto thee O Lord and we shall be turned you see the desire is there but God's got to do the turning repentance is a willingness to turn the power to turn comes from the Lord himself and once we have turned to the Lord by faith he saves us in a moment I'm not one for altar calls I believe that if a man hears the gospel understands the gospel he'll be saved where he sits I'm not criticising those who do have altar calls it's just not my way now Calvin has a fiddle about you might not be surprised that Calvin has a fiddle about with this as you would expect because he doesn't believe a man can be willing to be saved unless he's saved first he believes you don't he believes you can't get you can't be willing to be saved you can't repent until you got saved first that's what he does with this verse I think and therefore he says only the elect are saved and they're saved before they repent if I understand Calvinism correctly some of you might know more about that than I do for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish and this was why the father sent the son men in Adam all die every breathing boy and girl man and woman who is not in Christ is in Adam the wages of sin is death God sent his son the Lord from heaven that men might be taken out of Adam and into Christ look at 1 Corinthians 15 1 Corinthians 15 uh, verses 21 and 22 1 Corinthians 15, 21 For since by man came death by man came also the resurrection of the dead for as in Adam all die even so in Christ shall all be made alive and this is why Paul speaks often in his epistles about being in Christ if we're Christians we're in Christ we're no longer in Adam we've been separated from Adam we've been cut off from Adam by the resurrection, the death, burial, resurrection of the Lord Jesus and now we're joined to Christ for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life so through faith in Christ's death we pass from death through Adam to everlasting life in Christ and we have, if we're Christians tonight we have everlasting life now if you look back with me again to John 3 and we'll just look at the verse before verse 15 and I want you to notice a difference John 3 15 the Lord says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life that's almost the same as the end of verse 16 except verse 16 says everlasting life so there's a change from eternal life in verse 15 to everlasting life in verse 16 now you might be interested to know the Greek words are exactly the same in both of those verses so what's the difference between eternal life and everlasting life and why did our translators choose to do that there is a difference why does the AV give us two English words where there's only one Greek word and the, and the modern translators will often make a big fuss about this but they do it themselves as I understand it, eternal, put simply, is the kind of life. It's the life of God. It's the nature of the life. It's eternal life. But everlasting is the length of that. So eternal, if you like, has to do with quality of life, God's own life. But because it's God's own life, it's automatically everlasting life because God is the everlasting God the Lord Jesus is the everlasting God and when we're in Christ the Holy Spirit comes into us we have everlasting life but the quality of this life is eternal life look at John 17 John 17 lovely verse, verse 3 and this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent so this is the quality of it this is what it is it's knowing God it's being joined to God this is life eternal 
And as those who know God share his divine life, they can never die. Hence, eternal life must also be everlasting life. But why does the authorised version use two different words? Well, I'm inclined with Dr. Ruckman to say that God, God's hand was uniquely upon the AV translators. Lots of people don't like that. Lots of good brethren don't like that idea. But I have seen so many marvels in this King James Bible over the years that I, th I think God had his hand in a special way upon those translators. It wasn't new inspiration. It wasn't a second inspiration. The inspiration was there in the original text that they used, or the Greek and Hebrew texts that they used. And by faithfully translating those texts, the inspiration carried over. But I believe, I believe often God oversaw them in a special way and chose them to use words that perhaps certainly modern translators would never think of. Think of it this way, to think of eternal and everlasting. The Bible says that every word of God is pure. Well, if that's so, then it can't be corrupted. If, it's, if God himself is pure, as he is, thank God, he cannot be corrupted. If his word is pure, it's an incorruptible word, and Peter teaches us this in his first epistle, chapter 2. The quality of the life determines the everlasting nature of the life. So I don't have a problem with the, our translators using the two words. I don't know whether there's anything new there for you tonight. I hope at least uh, something of the love of God might have touched us again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen.